All right, so we have about 45 minutes right now. Is that right? We can keep you guys all night long. No, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about Jakarta EE and tell you kind of what's going on there. And there's going to be a lot of history lessons along the way to talk about where we came from and where we're going and where we are. Uh, and just to give you a perspective of what's going on. And if it works out well, Kamesh is going to try to run a demo that he's never run on my computer before because his computer is running out of battery and we lost his power supply. So it was kind of like when we tried to catch a cab earlier tonight, right? He didn't have data, but his credit cards would work. I have data, but my credit cards won't work in Singapore. Uh, and Clement, he's, he's from France, and it just didn't work at all. So we had the American, the Indian, and the Frenchman. We couldn't get a cab what's, to save our lives. It was actually kind of interesting. So what hap- we used to have Uber in this town just one year ago. What happened? This is kind of... <laughs> yeah, so the Grab app didn't work for us. So let's go and dive into this content. I think we're going to have some fun this evening, talk about some interesting things. Tomorrow morning when we actually do the key, uh, kickoff keynote, you're going to see a demonstration around microservices and serverless architecture coming together to build a holistic application. We actually have an interactive game we'll play with you guys if all goes well. It's actually a fairly complicated demonstration you'll see from us in the morning. And then tomorrow afternoon we're going to do a serverless talk right, to talk about function as a service and how to run that on a Kubernetes backbone. And then on Saturday, we have a workshop that we're going to be doing uh, related to Istio and service mesh technology, which is super interesting also. So these are all kinds of topics we've been talking about for the last several days with different customers in town. And we'll be talking about at Vox Days tomorrow and Saturday. But let's go and dive in here. Uh, this is, my name's Burr Sutter. This is Kamesh Sampath. You can get our connection information there. And actually, the URL to this slide deck is right down here if you want it. So bit.ly future Java enterprise. That'll get you access to the slide deck and access to everything else. So we're here to talk about Jakarta E, and this is the new logo for Jakarta E, so just keep that in mind. We'll talk more about that later. We represent Red Hat Developer at developers.redhat.com, so that's the group that sponsors us within Red Hat to fly around the globe and talk to developers all over the place. I have a long history with Java user groups in North America. I was the Atlanta Java user group president for many years, gave birth to a conference there called DevNexus, which is now like a multi-thousand developer conference there. So I'm always excited to go out and talk to Java user groups all around the globe. That is certainly the kind of community I wish to belong to and love actually participating in. So it's, you guys have done a phenomenal job building up the local Java user group here and sponsoring your own Vox Days. That's a huge accomplishment for your local community. So I fundamentally believe in that. And so when I was preparing for this presentation, I went back to a 2003 presentation I gave for the Atlanta Java user group, 2003. So I said there's a lot of history stuff in here, and you're going to see a lot of this kind of thing. And this is a presentation I gave where I talked about, and you have to keep in mind, this is a long time ago. You know, so we had J2ME back then, right? There was no smartphone back then. This is long before the iPhone occurred, right? So we had J2ME and WAP. Anybody remember WAP? Okay. But we had, we had dumb browsers. We didn't have Ajax at this point, you know. But we actually could interface with email. We could interface with browsers. We could interface with workstations, whether that be Swing or .NET WinForm applications. I used to do a lot of spreadsheet integration with back-end Java applications or spreadsheets. And certainly we had a lot of business partners, uh, business-to-business transactions and through the firewall. And then you had on the right-hand side of this all your different data sources, whether that be a relational database. There was no such thing as NoSQL back then. Okay, this is 15 years ago. XML was a king at that point, and EDI-style transactions were very popular. You might actually integrate with an AS400 or uh, OS390 as an example. Maybe you had to integrate with PeopleSoft. Anybody remember those PeopleSoft folks? I'm speaking to a room full of youngsters. I know you're like, what? PeopleSoft, SAP? They're all dead, right? But what's really funny is these tiers of the architecture have not changed. We're still primarily, as developers, connecting front ends to back ends. At the end of the day, almost 90% of what we do, it seems like, when we're writing code, is building some interface, whether it be a user interface or an API, connected to some set of data. What we do in the middle has gotten very creative over the years. But otherwise, it's the same thing. Would you guys agree with that? We kind of pretty much just do the same thing for the last 20 years or so? I know I've been doing it for the last 30 years, just to put it in perspective, the same thing. We just do it differently. So we might have done it with servlets and JSP. We might have done it with struts. We might have done it with XML parsing back in the day. We certainly had EJBs back in 2003. We are also at that very moment exploring POJOs for the first time, plain old Java objects. You notice there's no spring here, because spring didn't exist in 2003. Okay, Rod Johnson's book, EJ, uh, J2E without EJB, came out in 2004. There was no spring, right? So we didn't have that at this point. Um, and you can kind of see over here, we had Entity Beans. We didn't have JPA. We had this weird thing called JDO at the time also. 
So just to kind of give you a perspective, this is when Java EE was king, okay? Specifically, J2EE is what it was called at this point in time, and we had to buy all our software from expensive software vendors. We had to get an application server from the folks at BEA, and it might have been $80,000 to get that set up. As a matter of fact, I did the pricing back in this era. The pricing to set up a Hello World website with Java EE was half a million dollars to buy the hardware, to buy the database, to buy the app server. Semantic Cafe, your IDE, was $30,000 for your team. So, you, you know, it was expensive back then. And so I just want to put that in perspective. And this is kind of where the original roots of J2E came from. This is what an architecture looked like. This is, we, we used this presentation, what we called our Guru Night at the Atlanta Java User Group. We had the best architects in the city come speak to each other about all their best practices and tools and techniques. It was a really great presentation. Uh, and I also copied this in at this point, too. These were the open source tools we had just told the world about in 2003, right? Ant, no Maven. JUnit, right? No NUnit or whatever. Struts. Struts was king of the universe at this moment in time, if you guys remember that. Uh, and JBoss had been born, and JBoss was in Atlanta. So we were talking about JBoss and Tomcat. And we were telling people, you don't have to pay $80,000 for an app server anymore. You don't have to pay a hundred plus thousand dollars for a portal server anymore, right? You could do it on this. So that hopefully that gives you a little perspective. And this is what it looks like from a J2E standpoint, right? So J2E 1.2 was born in about 2000, and J2E 1.4 born in about 2004, okay? And notice that the brand changed here at 2004. This is important. I just spent uh, all day with someone recently, hopefully not in this room at this moment, and all they said was J2E this and J2E that, and I said, you know, we changed that brand 15 years ago. 15. It went to J2E to Java EE 15 years ago. Okay? But this kind of gives you a little perspective of what's happening here. You can see the original players like TMAX Soft. We, unfortunately, we don't have some of the good players on here. Like um, back then, Macromedia was a player in the app server business. If you remember, Borland was a player in the app server business. You know, what happened to all these folks? And this is what J2E looked like, you know, especially J2E to Java EE. We, it started off as fairly short intervals, like 19 months, 21 months, and then it got fairly long towards the end. So Java EE 8 was 15, 52 months long. So the process is getting longer for two reasons. One, it's you know, designed by committee and working across multiple vendors. There's some issue there. But also, it's just the fact that it was a mature specification. So you don't, you don't constantly churn SQL as a specification. You don't constantly churn HTTP as a specification. As a matter of fact, we live with HTTP 1.1 for a really long time. And most people don't even know there's an HTTP 2 yet. There is, by the way. It's been out for a few years now. But no one even knows. You know, as an example. So standards do kind of evolve slowly when they're important standards that run a significant amount of the world's transactions. TCP, SQL, HTTP, J2E, right? Or Java EE at this point. Um, kind of go here. I want to give you the short history of microservices. Again, a lot of history here to give some perspective. In 1999, when things cost half a million dollars to do Hello World, we wanted to find ways to improve the productivity of development teams. And so a group got together and created this thing called you know, continuous integration in the context of XP, extreme programming. We had the Agile Manifesto. Those folks went away that, you know, and basically sat on the mountaintop and came up with the Agile Manifesto. And they did that in February 2001. And then you notice EC2 was born in 2006. The cloud was born in 2006. It's, two, it's 2018 now, so 12 years ago the cloud was born. We also started talking about DevOps in 2009. We, start, we had Java E6 in 2009 to kind of give perspective there. So that was when we added things like dependency injection that we saw in the Spring universe back into the specification through CDI, as an example. Uh, then Netflix moves to Amazon in 2010. This is a notable moment. This is when a, person, a, a team with a rather large workload said we're going all in on cloud. We're, we're selling our data centers, getting rid of them, and going to the cloud and doing cloud-native architecture. Drop Wizard was the first fat jar architecture to show us microservices before there was the term microservices for Java developers. So Java, Drop Wizard, which is still fairly popular in England. Don't know if it's very popular here in Singapore. Anyone using Drop Wizard here in Singapore? You know? So like in England, it's all over the place, but you don't find it around the world. But it was the very first you know, uh, fat jar architecture of significance. And then you had Ribbon being open sourced by the Netflix team, Hystrix and Eureka, all in 2012. So the stuff that we're super excited about now, microservices architecture, 2012 was when it came out. 
So we have to keep that in mind. You know, these things have happened a long time ago. Microservices was first identified by the ThoughtWorks radar in 2012. Docker was born in 2013. Spring Boot born in 2013. Uh, microservices officially defined in 2014. And probably a very notable seminal moment was Kubernetes born in 2014. So at, you can see that these things started aligning and the world starts changing for us fairly dramatically at this point in time. Okay, so this actually caused a significant disruption to the way we write software completely, right? It wasn't just J2E or Java E being disrupted. It was everything being disrupted. We were going from traditional monolithic software that deployed every six to nine months. Most of you here probably deploy every three months. And you probably, you're like clockwork. Every three months we deploy. Every six months we deploy. To this world of we want to deploy every day. Well, how do you do that? It's a fundamentally different world. Okay? So let's kind of keep going here. Also in 2017, I was here a year ago talking about Kubernetes and Vertex. If you guys came to this session last year, I was doing a Vertex presentation with Edson Yanaga. Clement here just to talk about Vertex this uh, tomorrow. He's our Vertex expert. And we talked a lot about Kubernetes. And in 2017, all the original people who were like, we don't like Kubernetes, have now adopted Kubernetes. And that includes Amazon, okay? So everybody now loves Kubernetes, and it's the de facto standard for cloud-native software with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation to move your application workload from maybe an on-premise cloud to an Amazon, to an Azure, to an IBM, to an Oracle, to whatever cloud you want, and back again. It is the standard for building applications in a cloud-native way now. So just keep that in mind where everybody's super excited about Kubernetes. This is what the Kubernetes ecosystem now looks like. It has exploded in the last several years. What used to be a single Google project where they called up Red Hat and said, hey, we're going to do this thing. We're going to open source Google. You Red Hat people want in? We said yes. And then if you see in the presentation back in those early days, they basically said, well, Google, we run 2 billion containers a week. We know how to run containers at scale. We've been doing it for a decade. And so we jumped in on that project. We're still the second largest contributor to Kubernetes outside of Google themselves. And we're still very much committed to putting everything in the upstream at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. And so you can see a lot is happening in this space. Okay? As we're, you know, you can't even read this chart anymore. It's got so much going on. And uh, so just keep that in mind. In 2016, we made a very special announcement at Dev Nation 2016. We had these folks on the stage. This is a fellow from IBM. This is a fellow from the London Java user group community. This is Mark a little from our team, who is from Red Hat. And we announced this thing called MicroProfile. So we, Red Hat, IBM, Payara, Tommy Tribe, got together and said, you know what? The Java E specification is just not moving fast enough. Let's start our own standard. And that's what we did. We gave birth to a standard called MicroProfile, separate from the Java E community at that point, separate from Oracle. And then we gave you know, birth to this thing called MicroProfile. And we started moving along. We actually started with a 1.0 in 2016 with these three specifications, CDI for dependency injection, JSONP for JSON processing, and JAXRS for a RESTful endpoint. If you think of a microservice, an average microservice, it's kind of just a REST endpoint or a series of REST endpoints. And it goes deployed in your war file, like if you're into thin wars, deploy it in your war file, or if you're into fat jars, deploy it in your fat jar, right? And there was multiple implementations of this in the market at that time. So Payara, Tommy Tribe, IBM, and Red Hat, okay? We then moved the specification from a default entity just running at micro, uh, MicroProfile I.O. to the Eclipse Foundation. Notice it took a year to do that. It takes time to move your content to a new governing body with all the IP associated with it. It just takes time. It takes time to negotiate with the different parties and it takes time to negotiate with Eclipse Foundation in this case. So we moved it over there in 2017. We started adding more capability to it, like a config specification. Then in October 2017, you can see it's starting to move faster now, right? We added method, uh, metrics, health check, JSON web token, fault tolerance. And then in January 8, uh, 2018, you can see we've updated several specifications and added open tracing to it. So if, if you're looking at just discrete microservices, often based on a REST endpoint with JSON payloads going back and forth, you know, in a fat jar architecture, now there's a standard coming out of the microprofile community all within Eclipse. So this happened in January 2018. Now, we're, there's another spec on 2.0 where this is roadmap item. So this is what we're working on, adding JSONB as an example. 
Okay, and these are the supporters of MicroProfile at this point. Again, the original ones were the Payara, Tommy Tribe, IBM, and Red Hat, along with the London Java User Group and the Brazilian Java User Group. Several Java communities also joined us for this effort. Um, but you now see Lightben, Oracle, Microsoft, Microsoft joining these things. Kind of interesting, isn't it? The world has changed. If you guys remember, you know, Linux is cancer, Microsoft. This is a different world we're living in now, right? They love Java. They really embrace Java now as an organization. And you can see this note from David uh, Delabasi from August 2017 about the need to open up Java E and open sourcing it. So this was an announcement, and then negotiations happened on the backside to basically say, where can they open source this technology? Uh, and it came to the Eclipse Foundation as EE4J. So it should be kept in mind these were parallel efforts, micro profile just working on their own and then moving to the Eclipse Foundation, and then Oracle deciding, you know what? This thing needs to be open sourced so it can move along at the proper rate it needs to. And Oracle then looking to donate their assets to an open source project, and in which case Eclipse Foundation became the owner of that. So this happened uh, as E4J, and then we started doing some things like we need a name because Java is still owned by Oracle. The word Java, right? They still have Java SE, what we think of as the Java programming language. So there had to be a non-Java EE. So there was a, a vote that was held, enterprise profile. There were several many, many options put forth, most of which did not pass legal muster, because the weird thing that's hard in software engineering, right, is how to name your project. Have you guys felt that pain before? And if you ever try to pass a name by a legal team, it can be very painful. Okay, they will tell you no to everything. Uh, so Enterprise Profile was one of the finalists, but Jakarta E actually won. Jakarta being the largest city on the island of Java, not too far away from here, as an example. Um, so I don't know if they did a big party there or not. I haven't heard of one. But that was Jakarta E was the name that won. And then they crowdsourced the logo as well. All right, so in the case of the logo, the community basically decided not only on the name, but also what the logo should be. This logo actually came from one of our designers who's been part of the JBoss uh, design team for 15 years now, I think. He designs all the different logos, often within the Red Hat universe and within the JBoss universe, and designed this one too. They put it out for public vote, and it won. So now we have a name, we have a place to put it, we have a logo, and you can kind of see we have a bunch of sponsors, including uh, uh, some folks that have been added not too long ago, like SAP, Pivotal, WebTide, Lightbend, Microsoft we mentioned earlier, Vaden. There's a number of people that are part of the overall Jakarta E community now, okay, and supporting that standard. And, of course, there's groups that are being starting to meet and talk about where they want to go from a roadmap standpoint. So here's actually a, a, an important element of what's going on inside that specification. If you think of all the APIs that are part of Java EE, and this is an important point, you can see many of them have hit the 80% mark, and you can read what David wrote about that. We're getting closer. 80% mark means the initial contribution is pushed to an Eclipse Git repo. Okay? So this is the APIs themselves. The TCKs will come a little bit later. But it is moving. The, all that stuff that was housed within Oracle land is now moving to the Eclipse Foundation. This means it's going to be open, open to all of you, both your contributions at the code level or just your thoughts and energies around the APIs themselves. You can now participate when you used to be behind you know, the JCP process, right? It's now going to be much more open. And the Eclipse community is starting to understand how they want that to, uh, how they want that to unfold. There was also an important survey that was conducted just a little while ago in March to March time frame, 18, uh, 1,850 people five people responded to it. And so these were developers, people who obviously care about Java EE in, in total. And I thought this was very notable. The top three things people felt were critical was better support for microservices. Maybe they can borrow some ideas from the microprofile team, considering they're the same team, as an example. Native integration with Kubernetes. That's why I brought up that Kubernetes point earlier. Kubernetes is now the de facto standard for cloud native apps. So maybe we need to find better ways to integrate Kubernetes. And I'll give you one uh, certain example. I was talking to some of the engineers on the IBM side who are working on uh, the microprofile capability now. And what they're going to do is look to integrate Istio circuit breakers into the language. So I don't know if you guys have seen Istio, the service mesh technology. It basically can sit on top of like a Kubernetes. We'll do the workshop on Saturday on Istio. But it means you don't have to put circuit breakers, fault tolerance, uh, lookup, load balancing, you know, discovery. You don't have to put that in your code anymore. You don't have to have all those spring cloud annotations anymore, right? You basically put them back in the infrastructure where they belong, leaving your business logic clean. 
as an example. And so Istio is that technology. It's a sidecar technology, service mesh technology. And so can we find clever ways to integrate with the events coming out of Istio back into the code itself to call, let's say, a fallback method when the circuit breaks at the Istio level without adding the circuit breaker into the Java code, as an example. Uh, and then, of course, just the overall faster, faster pace of innovation. You know, we also asked, what are you guys looking for from a microservices standpoint? Jersey, Spring, Eclipse uh, MicroProfile, Node.js, and Kubernetes. And I thought that was kind of funny, right? K Kubernetes is a little different than the rest. But look at Node.js on that list. Isn't that interesting? And I can tell you, I, I go out and speak to you know, thousands of developers, mostly within the Red Hat ecosystem, and we talk to lots of Red Hat customers. They're interested in Node.js also. So Node.js is an up-and-comer in this overall world inside the Java ecosystem. And so can we, how can we find some interesting ways to integrate with a Node.js solution, as an example? You know, there could be some very interesting things there. And then um, the other one that I thought was interesting is when I go out and talk to audiences like a Java user group or Vox Days or DevOps or DevNexus, Typically, when we deal with a group of people at the user group community, you folks are the elite of the elite. So I want you to think about that for a second. There's approximately 10 million professional developers doing, you know, they're getting paid to do software development on this planet, supporting 7 billion human users, right? Everyone has a mobile app at this point, you know, and some back-end API that supports it. So the ratio is already really bad, you know, the number of real digital creators to the digital population that needs our creations. But then if you think of the people who show up at our Java user groups and our conferences, we're dealing with maybe 30,000 people worldwide of the 10 million. So you guys are, you know, talk, forget the one percenters. You guys are the, you know, one hundredth of a percenters. You are the elite of the elite in the Java ecosystem. So you should be pretty proud of yourselves. And I'm not, I'm not making fun of this. This is serious, right? You truly are the most ambitious, dedicated, and diligent professional programmers on the planet just by showing up for your user group and showing up for your conference. I feel that's a very incredible, important point. But in that group, this group here, these people said 67% of what we're trying to do is moving to microservices. We're going to start moving to microservices, 67% of, of us, within the, uh, the next year. When I go out and talk to user groups, it's greater than 70%, at least, that are trying to move to microservices. Now, I, when you actually drill down on that, most people don't know the proper definition of microservices. We're not going to go into that tonight. But that's often a problematic area where people are like, oh, yeah, I'm doing microservices. What are you doing? Well, I use Spring Boot for this. Uh, no, that's not exactly right. Okay. Well, I use Tomcat over here. No, that's still not quite right. You know, you know, they're, not, they're just building a monolith a different way in most cases. But that's fine. You know, you're building a cooler, sexier, faster monolith. That's still awesome for your organization. Okay? But a lot of everyone is looking at microservices as a fundamental new architecture. Okay, and let's see here, we're almost done. We have our, our microprofile implementation. It's called Wildfly Swarm at this moment, at this moment, but we have a brand new name. We're going to rename it because naming is hard. Okay, and you might have thought when you saw, has anyone even heard of Wildfly Swarm? All right, you can keep your hand up. It's okay. We're proud of you, man. <laughs> so, um, you know, so if you guys are looking at microservices architecture, how many people here are looking at Node.js as an example? Nobody? Eh, just one? Okay. It's okay. Node's cool. All right. I like Node also. Uh, anyone using Vertex, looking at Vertex technology? Because you're sitting by Clement. Is that why? Yeah, because Clement made you say that. Another gentleman in the back there. Anyone? And we said no one was on Drop Wizard. Anyone using like the uh, micro framework or any of the other? There's, a, there's about 5,000 microservices frameworks. Any one of them? It's kind of like the NBC Wars or Ajax, you know, <laughs> Web Wars. And then how many people are looking at Spring Boot as their solution for micro, uh, microservices? Okay. Not, you guys, you can raise your hand. It's okay. Normally, it's more people than that that are doing Spring Boot. So Wildfly Swarm is an implementation, a fat jar implementation, based on microprofile using Java E standards. We'll show you some of the code in a second. Kamesh will do that demo. But the name Wildfly Swarm was actually problematic because Swarm is also used in the Docker community for their competitor to Kubernetes. Okay, it's Docker Swarm. So that was problematic, and Wildfly, which comes from our existing app server, the old JBoss app server is renamed Wildfly, is seen as a traditional Java app server. And we want to kind of change the game here. So we renamed it Thorntail, so just keep that in mind. And now it's time for a demo. So Kamesh has never used my computer before. We're going to see if we can actually run the demo and show you the code. If not, we'll see what we can make work here. You want the microphone? Yes, that should help. I think it's the down. 
sure what this Don't take is. Off here. No? Yeah. That's good. I'll leave him to drink some water. So he's been speaking since morning. So um, all right, so so before we go there, I think before I get on to the demo, I just want to sh show you a couple of things which we mentioned as top critical things, right? So when we mentioned that we want better support of microservices and then native integration with Kubernetes. So what, is, what does it mean? Like, so how do I deploy my, I, we are talking about microservices, micro profile, Wi-Fi swarm and all these stuff. So we want to say, uh, how do we deploy into Kubernetes? That's, that makes things more interesting to you. So that's what I'm going to show you. Uh, before I get on to here, so it's, it's quite usual. I think people would have uh, seen this. I'm sorry about that. I'm using Burst machine, so I might be a bit slow. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is a, a Wildfly Swarm site. Uh, if you can, not sure if people can see there. Okay, so it's a Wildfly Swarm. I just need to get this out. So if people want to go from where I want to pick this up, uh, this is quite analogous to common microservices framework. So you can go to wildfly-swarm.io. I think soon you should see thorntail.io soon. Um, so we have a generator link here, so which can give you a zip or a template of the project like you have used in any other framework like Spring Boot or anything. So you can just choose this. But the only difference is that it gives you all the microprogramming profiles that is there available for you to download. So for example, in this case, I'm just going to create a project called this demo, and then I'm just going to use microprofile. Uh, so microprofile uses combination as burst shown in the first version, it has CDI, and it has, um, <clears throat> if I'm not wrong, I'll just get refer. Jack service and JSONP. I think these are three things which comes from the microprofile together. Instead of you adding multiple dependencies together, just going to have one dependency, which is going to get you all of the stuff, which is part of that. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and then say, um, that is that generate project so I should uh, technically get a zip uh, downloaded um, I'm just getting it. right I got a zip here so what I'm going to do is like I'm just going to go to my CLI um, before that I want to show you so I, uh, we have uh, the Kubernetes we're talking about enterprise right now so I just want to show you uh, OpenShift here so OpenShift is nothing but enterprise Kubernetes that's from Red Hat. So we ship all the enterprise-related features into Kubernetes and then give it for the enterprise to take and work on it. So what I'm going to do is like today, I'm going to deploy uh, the microservices onto OpenShift, which means that it aligns with Jakarta EE with an enterprise Kubernetes for you. All right. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is just go down um, and then I say unzip. Right. With burst worm, if I'm just making a temp directory here so that you can knock it off. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> demo space one dot zip. I go to the finder and then I can rename this back. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. There we go. Let's go and see. Okay. Okay, so if we go to this uh, demo folder here, I'm just going to say open that up and we shall see the code for you. So, so no big deal. So if we have seen the uh, the stuff, so you can see a bomb. Uh, I'm not sure, guys, is visible there. Are you wanting me to blow it up? Okay. Uh, so you see, you should see a wildfire bomb, uh, which has all the dependencies that you want there. And then as I said that, I'm just going to add only one, the API for compilation, and then I have microprofile uh, added to this. So having this, I'm going to get JAXRS and all other stuff that's going to get into my application, including CDI. So let's go and quickly see the class that's going to be there. It's not a big 
it's pretty complicated, so it might take time for you to understand this. So, um, so just in a hello application, um, it's just in REST endpoint. So what I'm going to need to do is like I just need to go and add um, an application class to make sure that it gets deployed as a jar. Um, so I'm going to copy paste the package from here. In fact, let's do this. Uh, hello world application. I'm going to say. Path that's going to be slash and then that's a constrictor. All right, I think uh, I just save this as. Application dot Java. Right. So still the um, plugin is downloading its dependencies here. So let's give some time for that. So while this happens, I'm just going to add a, a Docker file. And uh, I'm going to check where do we had the other one. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just going to copy the Docker file from somewhere else, so it's, it's all the same. So we're just going to put this up, and then I don't need all these guys, so I don't need this. So this is going to build me a demo swarm.jar on the target, and this I'm just going to deploy this back here so it's still loading yeah so i'm just going to do a me and clean package i know this will fail yeah, this is the uh, JAX RS core application. So I'm just saying this application path. And then I should say the root path of my REST APIs. At least I'm not going to do other stuff. I'm just going to say this. And then we have one this point. I'm just going to do a clean package now. OK. So in the target, we should see a couple of files. One is the. Uh, the, war, the traditional war file, which you can take and deploy it on any of the EAP servers. And then if you want to do the, the traditional microservice Java dash jar kind of a way, then you should see something called as demo swarm dot jar. So that's a jar which kind of has all the dependencies and builds you the Uber jar for you to go and deploy that, right? So uh, let's quickly run uh, from the CLI to see how it runs. So I'm just going to go to, uh, okay, I'm here. So I'm just going to do Java dash jar target. There you go. So it has the JSON P, Jax RS, and every other stuff is loaded for you. And it says it's listening. And then you see Wildfly Swarm is ready for you to deploy the application. So let's do a quick uh, curl localhost 8080. I mean, I'll just clear the screen for, for clarity. Slash hello. Right? There we go. So you got the application deployed and start running, which means that my application is good. So, so how do I deploy this? As I told you earlier, so I'm going to deploy this uh, into this project. I think I'm going to go to OC project. My, I'll, I'll show you what this means in a second. So what I'm trying to do is like I'm just going to deploy this stuff into a uh, this namespace, this equipment is namespace, what we call as project in OpenShift. So it's quite analogous to each other. So I'm just going to take this and deploy this here. So before this, uh, if people are used to doing Docker builds, making application container-based images, the couple of things which you usually do is like one thing we already done, we package the jar. Uh, once we package the jar, the next stuff you have to do is like we have to build the Docker file and make the container available for you. So we already, if you notice that, we already wrote uh, this container stuff, and then we said, okay, I'm going to do this, use this, 
uh, JDK image, and then I'm going to copy this swarm.jar into my application and then deploy it into OpenShift, right? So uh, when I say this, so what does it mean is that I have to build. So usually what we do is like we create a package and then we do a Docker build and all other stuff. But with OpenShift, we don't need to do that. I just need to configure my build config and say start building it. That's it. So what I'm going to do right now is like I'm just going to go back here and then say, oh, log in to your server? Uh, I think, yeah. Admin hyphen P. Open shift dot. Uh, so this is my server. Uh, it's my console. I'm just going to do a login here. So it's a secure supply. Right. So um, as I sold you a project, I'm just going to go to my project. Okay, so uh, OC, I'm just going to see if I have any application just to show you that there's no application here. There's just no project. OC get pods. I don't have any pods right here. So what I'm going to do right now is the first job is that I have to say that do a build. So I say OC new build. I say binary, which means that take my Docker file and start building it. And then I give a name call this demo and then I give a label saying that make this as my app call this demo you can have any label but it just just a convention so but we use so I'm just going to do this um, the moment I do this so if I go to the console uh, and I'll show you where it gets created um, if you go to bills so yeah take some time for it to go there yeah probably <laughs> If I end of the day, so it's slow like me. So uh, come on, All right? Not sure. Yeah, we got this here. So so we got one build here. So it says that if you see this, this is the Kubernetes YAML. I'm just trying to avoid the developers from creating these kind of YAMLs and deploy the application, which is the main, most painful part when you start deploying application to Kubernetes. So what you've done right now is that OpenShift can take care of all these stuff. I don't need to do this anymore. So I've already packaged this. I'm not going to do package again. So what I'm going to do is like, I'm just going to start the build. OC start build. I'll give the build name. Just saying that from this DIR, which means that pick up the Docker file from my current directory. And then I'm going to say follow. Right, if you see this, so you don't need to type this. I'll show you what is the advantage of this. You don't need to actually kind of do a Docker build every time. I can just start a build. I can set environment variables. For example, usually in an enterprise deployment, you'll be having Nexus. I can make my build point to the Nexus so that your builds are faster. Right? So I can start doing all these kind of stuff and furthermore stuff like getting other configurations inside security and all of this stuff, web books, whatever you call it. So anything that is related to build could be done. So we could also see here, it says that build is running. So which means that the build has started and start, it's just uploading your uh, Docker binary there. So once it is done, um, it gives some second when the network is slow. So the next, the next task you have to do is like I have to create, create an application, so which is what I'll be doing soon. So once the build is done, I'll just create an application and finally I have to open the application for the servicing to the external world. So that's the last step which we usually do. So, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, while this happens, so see, if, if you've seen this right now, so what I've done is like, there are multiple steps which are involved here. So I have to first go to the generator, download the zip file, open the zip file, create a Docker file, and do multiple other stuff before I can actually deploy the application to any other uh, Kubernetes-based environment. So what you can do instead of that is like, if you use, like we have something called as launcher. Uh, the launcher gives you uh, supported runtimes, like Red Hat OpenShift supported runtimes. So you can just choose your runtime where you want to run. These are the currently supported runtimes, so you don't need to generate these things. What you basically do is like I go ahead and say, okay, launch my project, and then I say, give your name. I say, demo two, right? And then it says where you want to deploy. So I say, okay, go and uh, deploy to my OpenShift cluster. 
and then once I say this is a Kubernetes cluster end of the day, and then these missions and runtime. So these are some best uh, patterns, microservices pattern that we said. For example, CRUD, caching, circuit breakers. So it gives you a template to get started with these kind of microservices patterns so that you don't need to start writing and including those dependencies. So and then let's say I want to do a health check. This again a REST API. And then you can choose your framework which you want. You want Vertex or you want Spring Boot or you want Wildfly Swarm. The advantage here is that it's all tested on OpenShift by Red Hat. I think it's guarantees that this definitely will work. This version of the runtime that you see here will definitely work on OpenShift. So for enterprise customers who think that, okay, what version, what support I'll get, okay, you can just be sure that you're using this version, it definitely runs on OpenShift. Right. So I can just say, go ahead and say Wildfire Swarm, and then go down and then say, give some name. So this actually creates a project in GitHub. So this is mapping to Clement's uh, GitHub repository. So I'm just going to create one project with this permission there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and then I say set up the application. So it, it basically goes there uh, and starts creating a GitHub repository. So you can map it to your local GitHub URL as well. And then it starts pushing the uh, code there and then starts create the project in OpenShift. And then it starts running a build there. So instead of you doing all the steps which I'm manually doing right now, this is going to do out of the wizard for you. So you don't need to worry. What is it? For example, this is another build which is going to run. So this might take time um, because like I have to change this build to use uh, Nexus. I already have Nexus deployed. So what I'm going to do is like, as I told you, uh, to the build config, uh, I can go here and then edit the build config uh, environment and say add a value and say maven mirror URL. So I already have a Nexus deployed if people know Kubernetes. So I just use the Kubernetes local URL. It's deployed into a project called as uh, Nexus. Uh, okay. I'll go to the URL here. CTP. Nexus.apps. I guess so this is the one, okay. So, slash nexus. I have an nexus deployed in my local cluster, so uh, I'm just going to reuse this and just going to grab the last part of this URL, so that is easy for me. Okay, so it's a nexus content group public. So this is an outside world access, but if you want to access it from it, within this cluster, I just need to give uh, the nexus and then followed by the, the project name and the path, and then the complete path to pick this up. And then I say save. So this is an advantage that when you're doing a build, so all these things you usually do manually on a command line, or you have some script scripts which I usually do that. But when you're using build config with an open shift, I don't need to do all this stuff. Right. So when I get, get back here and then say, okay, start this build again. So my build should be faster, otherwise it takes 12 minutes because it has to get all the Maven artifacts inside your uh, container. So we can just use the log here. So while this does, let's go back and see what's my, okay, my application is pushed. Uh, if you go back to the URL, the other one, so if you see there is a build, if you see there is an image, the new Docker image has been built there, and this image is available for you, right? So what do I do? Um, I'm just going to go create the same command. There's a bunch of commands available with thing. I'm just going to say new app, app name, I'm going to say app name, and then I'm going to give label. If you remember that, this is very important because uh, with this label, it's going to map which Docker image it has to pick up. That's the reason I'm giving the same uh, uh, labels for both the cases. So once I do this, uh, so we'll see this um, application here coming soon for you. Okay, so let's see what happens. So here, if you this, the build is done here. So, and then this project is created. So if you see this, this is a wizard based approach. Like I'm just doing click, 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 and then it has a template, and then you can have your own templates defined, and then map to this launcher so that you don't need to depend upon the common community templates which we have. And it's across runtimes. So it could be Spring Boot, it could be Wildfire Swarm, it could be Vertex, anything you name, right? So uh, this way, like it helps you to go faster in development so that like you don't need to do all these manual commands which I'm typing right now. For example, it's already there. Uh, let's quickly see where it is. So if you see this, the application is here. 
so which is pushed here, and then it's still not as exposed, right? Which means that I have to go and say, the command itself says that what I have to do. So just do this after you create the application. The moment I do this, uh, you will see the there's a new URL which is coming up here, so which, to which I can access the application. I don't have anything in the root, as we know that we just did right there. So there you go. So my application is deployed now, the same application which is deployed running on my local. I just dockerized, deployed it onto the cloud. So this is a manual steps which I showed you, but if you use wizard, then it's all done for you automatically. So if you see here, I did not do anything. I just did that and then map nexus to it because I need the builds to be faster. And that's all. I choose the runtime which I want. My application is deployed for me with an open shift, which is Kubernetes sent all the day. So this is again another application. So where you can go and access to kind of hello world kind of stuff. So this is two ways by which you can deploy applications. There are furthermore ways you can customize and start deploying applications cloud native way using Jakarta EE and MicroProfile. Okay. And that's all. I think it's over to Burr. Let me show. I want to, there's one thing I want to show though, real quick. Let's see if we can fix it real fast. Uh, any, and just to kind of give you guys a better so we this is what this is our SDA tutorial. What we've done, we've implemented micro profile as an example, but we also have Spring Boot for that's examples. So you can kind of see right here, you can kind of see there's the at get, at inject. So this is just fairly standard JEX right, that you're seeing here. So at path. So it's just a different set of annotations. So I think of it. You know, so this is the uh, JEXRS way of doing it, microprofile way of doing it. And then we also have, Spring Boot. yeah, where is the Spring Boot version? Down here, yeah. there we go. So the same endpoint is implemented in multiple ways. Because what we're trying to show is that you can run all this on Kubernetes, right? We're trying, that's really what our focus is on, how to run it on the underlying platform, get it Dockerized, get it running at its scale in a Kubernetes backbone, OpenShift backbone. And this case, with the Istio service mesh technology, so you get all the distributed tracing, circuit breaking, um, metric capture, all that stuff, basically, in the infrastructure. And it's not part of your business logic. You can see this is fairly straightforward business logic uh, with some mangling of headers and things of fun nature. But it's just a Hello World style application. OK? And this, you have the same thing on, like I said, on the uh, micro profile side. So really just a different set of annotations. All right, so that's really all we have for our presentation. Um, if you guys want more, you have any questions? Wow, silence, you're like, you're overwhelmed. You just can't take it anymore. Uh, but no, no specific questions. We can certainly be available after the next session and take some more questions there too. And again, keep in mind in the morning, we'll show you a really cool microservices plus function demo. Hopefully it works. You guys are praying for us, aren't you? You don't understand. We're running like a real hardcore demo, so it's, it's actually pretty interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll do serverless tomorrow afternoon, and we'll do re reactive with Clement tomorrow also. So are, how many folks are coming to Vox Days tomorrow? It should be all the hands, okay? Yeah. Are there any more tickets left? Yes. Well, maybe you, you might be able to see the right people here to get a ticket still. Okay, um, but if we have, you have questions, feel free to come up and see us afterwards. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time, and uh, hopefully you guys got, did you get something out of the session? Was it valuable? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs>